the saints, let's just pause for a moment and bask in this music before us. Holy is the Lamb. Good morning, saints, and welcome to this house of prayer. God is here by his spirit, and you are here this morning by his invitation. We often consider, don't we, that we've got our clocks right this morning. Uh, I don't know how many of us stayed awake most of the night, hoping that the alarm would go off and that we wouldn't miss it. I certainly woke a number of times. But we are here by God's invitation. As well as it may be, this is what we do on a Sunday. I firmly believe that the Holy Spirit has made the way clear for you to be here this morning. Put it on your heart to be here this morning. Encouraged you and drew you here this morning despite what we might think. Because he wants to meet with you and he wants to talk with you and he wants to share with you. Now, it would be very easy for me to say this morning, we're going to do things a bit different today. Well, yes, we are, but I don't want us to look upon it as we're doing something different. What, in fact, I believe we are doing here this morning is that we are going to be led by his spirit for the message that he wants to bring to us. Now, some may wonder, Russell, you've forgotten about the cleaning bucket. It will come to pass why I have placed a bucket on the altar this morning. So, as I learned in my CPE nearly 12 years ago, and as we heard at Synod this weekend, please trust the process. It will come to pass what all this means this morning, and by God's Spirit, you will leave here remembering what He spoke to you about here today, possibly more than other times. Uh, but there we go. We are on page 730 in our orders of service. And so we begin, grace and peace to you from God. God you truth and joy. And we all say together, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, so that we may truly love you and worthily praise your holy name. Through our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Happy. I believe the word should be joyful are those whose sins are forgiven whose wrongs are pardoned. Let us confess our sins to the Lord and let us not conceal any wrongdoings. Saints, be assured that God forgives and heals you. We need your healing, merciful God. Give us true repentance. Some sins are paid to us. Some escape us, some we cannot trust. Forgive us, set us free to hear your word to us. Set us free to serve you. <clears throat> Friends, God forgives you. Know that he forgives you. And then forgive others and forgive yourself. Through Christ, God has put away your sin. Approach now your God in peace. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. 
We're now going to listen to Bishop Steve's charge. What Bishop, what, what a charge is, is his encouragement, his vision, if you like, uh, for this diocese. Uh, a synod is very similar uh, to an AGM. It's a gathering together uh, in the spirit um, and uh, being led by uh, our very visionary bishop. And so Bishop Steve's, this is Bishop Steve's message, uh, sorry, uh, please, um, let's just listen to what he has to say. Lord, we need you. Lord, I need you. May you open our hearts and our ears that we may hear your truth from your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Kia ora whanau, my brothers and sisters, fellow members of the Anglican Diocese of Nelson Synod, to our visitors, to all of those connecting on live stream. It's a humbling thing for me to give my fourth presidential address as I reflect on three years since we designed together God's call for me to serve as your bishop. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the Lord Jesus Christ. Firstly, I, I want to thank you. I'm thankful to God for each one of you, for your faithfulness in the Lord Jesus Christ and his church over the last year. It's been a tough year for many of us, but you have kept faith alive in your communities during very turbulent times. Your contribution to our common life matters. I see what you do, and I'm deeply grateful for your mahi in the gospel. I'm deeply aware and I'm profoundly grateful for God's sustaining grace to all of us. Secondly, my sense is that many of us are tired and anxious and weary. Some of you coming out of the COVID-19 season, you feel like you've got less wind in your sails. The disruption of the last two years has impacted churches and ministers in all kinds of ways, and we've had to adapt and change repeatedly to what has been going on around us. We know that God has been faithful, but many of us have so often grown weary and tired. We've seen the numbers decline, our volunteers' base shrink. Some of you are wondering what the future looks like. How do we sustain ministry? I hear you, I see you, I acknowledge the hard times that you faced and are facing. And so what's the spirit saying to the church right now? There's an old kindy rhyme that goes like this. I won't try and sing it. There is a hole in my bucket, dear Lisa, a hole. Then mend it, dear Henry. Dear Henry, mend it. And the rhyme continues. You see, the, the rhyme begins with stating the problem. There's a hole in the bucket. And to fix the leaking bucket, Henry needs a straw. To cut the straw, he needs a knife. To use a knife, he needs to sharpen it. But the sharpening stone has to be dumped, so he needs water. But to fetch water, he needs the bucket. And yet the bucket <laughs> is leaking. We have a hole in our bucket in the diocese. Several months ago, I asked my chaplain, Simon, to look at national and diocesan statistics and to help us understand our current realities. We'll be sharing some of that research at this synod. The numbers show a picture of a huge harvest field, and yet the workers getting fewer and older. We have a hole in our bucket. While the population of the country continues to grow, our diocese and statistics that are collected each year show a sobering picture. Over 22 years to 2018, our total parish attendance in the diocese fell by 40%. And that was before COVID-19 pandemic arrived. We have a hole in our bucket. Our situation is not dissimilar to other churches in the West. Global tents are showing great exodus from church from across the Western world. 
They are showing that people with no religious allegiance or the nuns are growing remarkably. And also those who are done with organized church. So the nuns and the duns are growing. I know so many people in the done category, I don't know about you, but the leaking in this category of the nuns is huge, and the done as well. We have a hole in our bucket. It's been said that we are losing a generation that wanted church, but perhaps not God, because we are nominal, and gaining a generation that's seeking God, but not church. My sense is that there's massive hunger out there for meaning, for connection, for community, for hope. But the expectation that the church can satisfy that hunger is low. We have a hole in our bucket. Global emerging trends are showing that we are living through a period of profoundly disorienting change, as Marx has put it where we're shifting from complicated world to a complex world. In our complex world, things are a lot more unpredictable. For example, in nature, 19 of the hottest years on record have occurred since the year 2000. And we keep getting the, 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 the message, well, it's only a 100-year event. In human nature, we are seeing a lot more social fragmentation. We have a whole in our bucket. The fact that there are no easy solutions to these complex issues magnifies the burden on leadership, ordained and non-ordained, who have to learn to minister in fragility when we are used to minister in stability. Many of us feel home de hope de diminish, a lowering of confidence to see real change, and a paralyzing dilemma on how to stretch dwindling resources. Left unattended, all this can easily compromise the vitality of our mission and even erode confidence in the gospel of the Lord Jesus. So how do we respond? The picture I'm painting is not cause for despair. It's an invitation for prayerful and urgent attention to the brutal realities we face while keeping our eyes on the unshakable hope that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we're here to do for the next couple of days. At the Synod, our theme is grow, the second plank in our gather, grow, go strategy. By grow, we mean growing in faithfulness or depth and also in fruitfulness, breath. It's growing deep to reach wide. I believe that God calls us to grow and healthy growth in depth and breath is intrinsic to the gospel. The gospel, in its very nature, grows and bears fruit. Now, God has provided gifts for us to access in order to flourish in faithfulness and fruitfulness. And so we turn to God's word in our two readings that were read to us to explore what God is saying to us about growth. There are three parables about growing seeds in Mark's gospel, chapter 4. They all have different emphasis regarding how God's kingdom come and how it grows. The parable of the sower emphasizes the power of good soil or the condition of the soil. The parable of the master seed emphasizes the potential of small beginnings. While our reading, the parable of the growing seed emphasizes the process of growth itself. So let's dive in and look at how the church grows. And I've got three key ideas. First, to grow, we look to God. Both our readings speak of God who makes things grow. Seeds planted grow in mysterious ways that we cannot explain. It is the work of God. It is a miracle that crops actually grow, that plants actually grow in the way that they do. I've been surprised in my garden in Atafai, but the plants I have not grown, but I have seen sort of just take root and grow. Potatoes, spinach, tomatoes, they just show up. I haven't planted them, but they just show up on the ground. It's actually quite amazing. Maybe it's my compost or something, but things just seem to grow in my garden. 
See, when it comes to personal and kingdom growth, we trust and worship the God of life, the God who is the origin of all life, the breath of spiritual new life, and the power of resurrection life. So in our weariness and our weakness, God's strength is proved. And so we are invited to look to God. In our sense of frustration and weariness, we look to God. We pray with confidence because we are convinced and convicted that God is at work, that God is building his church, that God is enough, and that he is with us. Do you believe that? This is the God who sustains us, who renews us, who refreshes us. And he is the one who gives us his spirit. That same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead poured upon us deep into our hearts so that we can reveal his glory in our own lives and in our communities. I think this is an exciting season to be in ministry and to be alive. Because we look to God. We look to God who makes things grow. That he would reignite new fire within us so that the gospel might take root and flourish in our lives and communities and that we would see kingdom growth. And so I'm calling us to a season of prayer and discernment where we choose not despair but hope as we deeply connect with God in prayer and listen to what his spirit is saying to us about the challenges we face and the opportunities before us. Are you up for that? Yes. Thank you. So we look to God first. The second day, to grow, we trust the process. Our reading from Mark's Gospel also reminds us that growth is a process. All by itself, the soil produces grain. First, the stalk comes up. Then the head appears. Finally, the full grain appears in the head. Before long, the grain ripens. It's just something there about process. Now, growing up as, as a kid in Kenya, I was a pretty impatient boy. Um, we would plant maize and beans, and I, I would go back after an hour to see whether the seed we planted had actually sprouted. And uh, a few hours, I'd go back, I'd water it, I'd go back, and my mother got tired of me going back to the garden. I don't think it was a good idea, because sometimes I'd dig it up to see what was happening, you see. So my mother would remind me, Steve, trust the process. The seed is alive and active even beneath the surface when you cannot see it. Trust the process. Trust something is happening even when you don't see it. That's what happens when the gospel seeds are sown. Growth is a process. Trust the process of the seasons to bring about the best in the plant. Even in winter when plants seem to be going through death, something is happening. It's also the time when the unhealthy staff dies so that the plant can be healthy. Sometimes things need to die before new life can come up. As Fred Barron says, soil is not dirt. It is alive, teeming with life in the secret ecosystem of work that goes on beneath the surface. You might be surprised by the deep work that God has been doing in people's hearts long before the gospel has been sown in their hearts, long before they show up at the door of a church. God is at work, even when we don't see it. Perhaps you're in a season right now of preparing the soil. You've scattered the seeds for a long time, but the germinating seed isn't being seen from the surface. Trust the process. Perhaps you're in a season of watering, weeding external threats and feeding your plants. Trust the process. Or perhaps you're in a season of harvesting the fruit. That's fantastic. Great. Discern new fields that are ripe for harvest. Trust the process. And don't forget next, next year is another season of planting. So keep some seeds for replanting. Trust the process. Now sometimes we are blessed to see the entire process from start to finish. Other times we are called to plant and water but don't have the privilege of watching the fruit develop. Growth occurs through the different seasons. Sometimes growth is obvious, other times in the dry spell, it is not. 
Then when the season changes, you realize that the drought strengthened your roots and you grew even though you felt like your soul was dormant. Trust the process and keep embedding those healthy rhythms and habits that foster the right conditions for growth. So no matter what season you're in, don't grow weary. The harvest is coming. It's not up to us to create growth. Our job is simply to plant and to water. Despite all our imperfections in our labor, the Lord will do the rest and he will do it perfectly. Trust the process. Keep planting, keep watering, keep feeding the plants. So to grow, we need to look to God. To grow, we need to trust the process. And then finally, to grow, we need to rise together. I belong to a squash club, club in Nelson. I love playing squash. Did you know that? And I love doing it on Thursday nights, so I'm missing that tonight. Thursday nights, it's a club night. It's where everyone comes around, maybe 20, 30 people in Nelson, and you get about 15 minutes to play with each player. Uh, the, the host will set the time part. After, after 15 minutes, you switch the players. And you get to play with different players uh, each night, uh, on Thursday nights. And the aim is of the club nights is not winning or losing, although I do like to win. I feel good when I win. Uh, there are no points awarded for winning. It's an opportunity to raise your game by playing with different people. And it's so much fun. So my final thought from 1 Corinthians reading is that Paul is explaining here, stating very clearly the truth that the church in Corinth needed to desperately hear. As they were starting to argue among themselves who they followed, one follows Paul, one follows Apollos, Paul was quick to remind them what matters the most. They are all called to follow Christ. That growth is God's work and their focus was to play their part in the process of growth, whether planting or watering. We are God's servants, Paul says, working together. You are God's field, God's building. Paul is saying kingdom growth happens in partnership. It's a team sport. We play different roles, but we're in the same worker, paddling together towards the same mission. Now, I know it's very easy to apply that passage to a single faith community or a congregation, local congregation. But what if we started to think beyond the concerns of our own patch and thought of ourselves as a single, united, diocesan family, one faith community across the whole diocese? We thought of ourselves as a family where we deal with each other's struggles together, where we rise together, where no community is left behind, a family where there's no place for division or competition, where we do not allow the hearts of the past to prevent us from moving forward together, like a building joined together, being built together, rising together in Christ, as Paul reminds us in Ephesians 2, verse 12 to 22. So I'm asking us all to work together as family, as, family, as a united team, to see kingdom growth under God. For we rise together. So to grow, we look to God. To grow, we trust the process. To grow, we rise together. So what? There is much that God is already doing across our communities and across his diocese. Make no mistake, I'm not saying there's nothing happening. A lot of good stuff is going on, but we have a hole in our bucket. We have urgent challenges to address, barriers to growth, and amazing opportunities for growth. Over the next nine months, I'd like to invite us to a season of discerning together God's invitation to grow in faithfulness and fruitfulness across the diocese. My prayer for this synod is that we would discern together the holes in our bucket that would have the openness to have our cups filled afresh by the Spirit in order to nurture the gospel seedlings that God is putting in our hands. And my commitment to you 
is to continue to listen to God and to you. I'm also cognizant of the promise I made prior to my ordination that I would lead you in mission. And so as we wrestle with these issues and ask what the Spirit is saying to the church, will you join me as we look to God in prayer for growth? Will you join me to continue in the mahi of cultivating the soil and planting and watering and harvesting as we trust the process of growth? Will you join me as we hold hands together with each other, as we rise together to grow into a kingdom movement of disciples who make disciples across the top of the south and beyond? Are you in? that invitation thank you lord would you open our eyes and our hearts to hear what your spirit is saying to the church at this time in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit amen Father, I thank you that you are not finished with your church. Father, I thank you that you have planted this fellowship in this place. Father, I thank you for the generations that have made it possible for us to gather here this morning. And so I ask you, Lord, to lay on our hearts what seed we will plant. What will we leave behind? What will our uh, endowment be to uh, the ongoing work of your Holy Spirit? Father, you remind me as I sit here in this house of prayer that for untold centuries there were workers who laid the foundation of a cathedral knowing full well they would never see it finished. Yet their work was diligent and important, and they knew that. Father, you too have called us as living stones to build your church in this community. Lord, we may feel that we don't bring much to the table. But that's not how you see us. You see us as people of great value. You see us as people with purpose. Father, your love and invitation towards us is only lessened by ourselves. So help us, Lord, to open our hearts to the invitation before us to join you in reaching this community, however that may look in our lives, in our area and circle of influence. Lord, a mighty river is made up of many, many raindrops. We all have something to bring and we thank you for that.
thank you that you have not left us or forsaken us. page 736. As Christ taught us, we pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Page 732. Please be seated. 732. Saints, the Lord is here. The Lord is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. And let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right for our thanks and praise. It is right indeed, ever living God, to give you thanks and praise. 
grace through Christ your only Son. You are the source of life and goodness. It is through your eternal word that you have created all things from the beginning. And when we sinned and turned away, you called us back to yourself and gave your Son to share our human nature. He made the one perfect sacrifice for the sin of the world. And therefore, we proclaim your great and glorious name, saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. On the night before he died, he took bread. And after he had given you thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. After supper, he took the cup. And when he had given you thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it to remember me. Therefore, loving God, recalling your great goodness to us in Christ, we celebrate our redemption with this bread of life and with this cup of salvation. Send your Holy Spirit that these gifts of bread and wine which we receive may be to us the body and blood of Christ. And that we filled with that same Spirit's grace and power. That we may be renewed for the service of your kingdom. And so reunited in Christ with all who stand before you, in earth and in heaven, we worship you, O God, in song and everlasting praise. Blessings, honour and glory be yours. So we break this bread to share in the body of Christ. We remain in our own body, for we all share the one bread. At the bottom of page 734 we say, Lamb of God, you take the grace of sin in the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take the grace of sin in the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take the grace of sin in the world. Saints, God has invited you here this morning and invites you to his table. Please come, receive from him.
referred the two, I'm not going to put anybody on the, on the spot, but referred the two something that somebody here in this fellowship said this morning uh, about how uh, the days of the vicar doing everything might be behind us. As I was listening to the bishops uh, charge today, and he only very briefly passed over it, but how many here, at, over at Kai Territory during the summertime, have seen those waka experiences going out? How many of those have you know, they take schools out on them. How many have seen a walker being being rowed? How many have seen that? I'm sure all of us have. I'm sure all of us. And how many people are steering that walker? So I'll leave that with you. I'll leave that with you as we journey in our walker together. It's a metaphor in there. <laughs> Sing our final song. May God be your comfort and your strength. God be your hope and support. God be your light and your way. And the blessing of God, creator, redeemer and giver of life, remain with you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Bless your saints for a wonderful week. Now just before we leave, uh, we are uh, live broadcasting the memorial service. I sent an email out to everybody, so I hope you read the emails. Um, so I sent that out. Uh, also, we've invited the whole of the community because we've put it out on the Macho Act community page as well. So the church will be open from 1.30 tomorrow morning, uh, tomorrow afternoon. We're not going to have morning. Forget that. I can edit that out. Uh, 1.30 tomorrow afternoon, uh, and we will be watching um, uh, the memorial service live here. So bless you as we gather for coffee.